Urvashi ji, um, Mr. Vikrant Mathur, uh, Mr. Rohit Kumar, uh, other representatives of the um, organization, distinguished um, participants, friends. It gives me an unusual pleasure to participate in this uh, particular session uh, organized by the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries. Uh, most of my life I have spent with um, teachers, children, some of it with bureaucrats and politicians, but the desire to interact with business people has remained a bit um, unfed, I should say. And I'm very happy, therefore, that um, today I celebrate my freedom by interacting with people who do business. Very exciting indeed. Um, I want to discuss with you many of the areas which, to my mind, are areas of either misunderstanding or uh, misimpressions, ignorance, and rigidities in what we call the education market, particularly the market of textbooks that is located within the education market. And perhaps one can start by simply comparing uh, what happens in these countries, which we call so-called developed countries, that is different from ours. And I can convey in nutshell the differences that in those countries textbooks make children read other books. In our country, textbooks confine our children. <laughs> now, if that conveys to you the impact that it all makes on the market, I think you will see something relevant. To me, it makes an impact on the overall quality of society. Education ought to make a society reflective, capable of thinking, uh, capable of discussing across differences of opinion. Generally, make a society more open, uh, more peaceful. We live in a knee-jerk society. <laughs> You're all going through right now a a knee-jerk phase. <laughs> uh, we live in a society where very often we end up fighting in public, on television. One of our most popular programs is called Big Fight. We are a society where our sensibilities are very easily hurt. If somebody has said something, you know, lots of people feel very upset and so on. We are certainly far from the vision that the Constitution of India places before us of becoming a sober society, where it's possible for children to look forward to a long life of creative growth, peace, and where they will see examples among older people, among representatives uh, of people, uh, examples of uh, exchange of views um, uh, without getting upset, uh, where children will notice how men and women can get along uh, without... Uh, demeaning, uh, men demeaning the women, where um, poverty is uh, not seen as a condition of life, but rather as a consequence of poor management of society, and so on and so forth. That's how the Constitution thought India would become. But 70 years later, we are not a country that reflects particularly well uh, on our education system. And we are all involved in it, whether we are in working in government or in private business, uh, as parents, and so on and so forth. It's very important for us to think, what is, uh, what is the problem? I think the pro there are many problems, but one way to proceed with this subject is to uh, look at textbooks. Uh, since the British introduced textbooks, published textbooks in schools, and, and that happened in 1830s, you know, something like uh, 200 years ago, close to 200 years ago, that the first textbook societies were created by uh, British rulers of India. Uh, it's remarkable that the role of the textbook hasn't changed in nearly 200 years. It's, a, it's, uh, it's something to reflect on. Textbooks were designed at that time to bring about some kind of uh, sense of uh, normative standards. And 
textbooks were designed to uh, bring about uh, a basis for examination. Examination was a central tool through which a uh, system of education was uh, normativized, so to say, in mid-19th century, when the first universities came up. High school examinations, examination began matriculating. Later on, other things happened. And the textbook, the word textbook, lay in the center. It was like sort of what you would call in a car or a truck, a sort of an axle, the axle around which everything moves. Right. And hence, textbooks were very, very became very central. They became an obsession for Indian society. Um, and what was particularly problematic about the textbook was that it drew attention to itself rather than take the child's attention to other books, to the world. The textbook is supposed to be a medium through which a child learns uh, to take interest in the world to take interest in other books, to, write, to become a reader. But our textbooks, uh, right from that formative period, developed this peculiar role of attracting all the attention to themselves <laughs> and become the means of preparing for the examination. Uh, that it, that's the way it was in um, the 1880s. That's the way it was in the 19... Um, 20s, when many of these boards that are now full-fledged state boards were created. And so it is now, in 2016, when we have a central board and we have 40 provincial boards and so on and so forth. It's not a story to be proud of. If we are celebrating things like independence, then it's not a story to be proud of because we haven't really overcome this obsession with a textbook that prepares you for examination. If you talk to private publishers, uh, I had had such an experience, and therefore I speak from uh, the memory of an afternoon when I spent a whole afternoon in NCRT as its director with private publishers. We had invited them to reflect with us what is a textbook. Then if you, if you meet private publishers, and you all represent that uh, remarkable industry, you end up feeling that in the popular Indian mind, the perception is that every textbook has to conform to a syllabus. And therefore, textbooks cannot be very different from each other. And so, therefore, what happens to the great ideal of business? Competition. Who is competing with what? If everything is more or less similar, then all you can uh, bring about in terms of difference is maybe quality of paper, quality of illustration, font size you have used, design, layout, etc. If your content is not different, then why should a good principal or a perceptive teacher bother if all that you're offering is, you know, these physical qualities? Well, we really couldn't get very far because people were fixated on this idea. We decided to proceed on this with a much sort of bigger canvas. Uh, those were the sort of days when, in 2005, the new national curriculum framework was being drafted, in which many people like our uh, chair today, Urvashi Ji, were involved. And we were hoping that we will redefine the idea of a textbook. Uh, many people thought that NCRT is a revising its books. I said, no, we are not revising them. We are producing new textbooks. And not just new textbooks, a new kind of textbook. And by new kind of textbook, we really meant a book that will treat itself like a window. A window should not attract attention to itself. Some windows do, unfortunately. They are opaque. Windows are supposed to make the scene outside look attractive so that you want to open the window, you want to open doors, you want to walk out into the garden of the world. We were hoping that we will produce such books. And we were hoping that private business will follow. Well, it's been 10 years. Private business continues to be stuck in old ideas about what is curriculum, what is textbooks, what is syllabus, what is examination. I feel that we all need to sit down and take a good look at these terms. In the National Curriculum Framework context, we, NCRT, produced 21 focus reports. We call them National Focus Group Position Papers. 
they are on different subjects, they are on different concerns. One of them is about this subject. It's called Curriculum Syllabus Textbooks. It's a document that I uh, request you to read on the internet, or unfortunately, Piki also couldn't get a copy, couldn't buy a copy, so they photocopied. We are becoming a photocopying nation, unfortunately, instead of producing original things, or buying original books. Our students are actually photocopying. And, and sadly enough, recently our Delhi High Court gave a judgment that photocopying is illegitimate. I hope that publishers won't accept it. I know a group of publishers have appealed, and I hope they win. This is a very serious problem. Uh, so I'm sorry about this detour. It's one of my hobby horses to condemn photocopying as something that keeps book business down. Uh, please re read that National Focus Group report, and that will help all of us to understand what is a syllabus. I'll very briefly explain the idea why the same syllabus can generate multiple textbooks of the kind that I'm talking about. Imagine five years from now, and I'm sure it will happen sooner than that, uh, some state government or NCRT or who knows, introduces the topic cashless economy <laughs> in its textbook, for, in its syllabus, it says. I mean, as it is, there is a topic called money at various levels. It comes in, uh, I think, grade eight currently in social and political life textbook. It comes in grade nine economic syllabus. It comes in grade 11 and so on and so forth. Now, supposing in that... Uh, syllabus says uh, the uh, demonetization process of 2016. Now, that's the syllabus. Syllabus gives topics. Now, how that topic will be treated five years from now by a group of people or a publishers who want to uh, introduce that topic in their textbooks? Friends, we are all living through this period of demonetization. You can see today, if you watch television, read newspapers, how many different viewpoints are there on this subject. These viewpoints uh, acquire their difference depending on which class of society you're looking at. There is a top layer of society which has credit cards and various other things, and they don't mind this period much. But there is a lower middle class, then there is a working class, there is the peasantry, there is the laboring class, which is having terrible problems. And we, who belong to the sort of middle class, which has one or two servants or driver or whatever, are having trouble paying them because they don't want, they, they don't have an account or they don't want a check right now. They want cash. And uh, on today or yesterday, they wanted cash, some cash. There was no cash. There are thousands of stories. There are several perspectives. There is a debate among economists. There are economists, Mr. Pangadia, who has supported it. There is Mr. Prashant, Mr. Mr. Prabhat Patnaik, who has opposed it. Uh, there are political wrangles. There are parties which don't agree, parties that agree. And there are parties within which one person agrees and the other disagrees. All this has to become a palpable living reality for a child of, let's say, 2021 or a child of 2030 who is reading about this subject. There are so many ways to treat this subject. A textbook lesson on this subject need not be identical in 10 different textbooks. In fact, we ought to have 10 different textbooks for a vibrant classroom where a good teacher can introduce a student to these different treatments. Some textbook has focused on the politics. Some textbook has focused on the commercial aspect of this. Some focus. Uh, somebody has focused on uh, what are these companies that are providing cashless services. One of these big companies is actually owned by, you know, in China. What does that imply? And so on and so forth. What does it do in this era of economy when Indian economy is getting gradually globalized? What does it mean for suddenly to be in a situation where a former prime minister and economist is saying it's going to slow down economic growth? Why was he saying that? These debates, these multiple perspectives, uh, these different experiences ought to be in a textbook, if it's a textbook in the new sense of the term. Now, what does that mean? You see, the old meaning of the word textbook was that a textbook contains facts. And that's why 
people fought over textbooks. They said, no, this fact is wrong. This didn't happen in history. You are saying it happened, you are a Marxist. This happened in history. Somebody is saying, no, no, you are a rightist. And we lost 30 years in that debate in our country. Ask yourself, why hasn't the NCRT textbook of 2006 not entered into that controversy? How did we overcome that controversy? It's certainly a, a good chapter in NCRT's own history that we settled that controversy. People have this stereotype that governments come and change textbooks change. No, this government came, this textbook, our textbooks remained. They haven't changed anywhere. In fact, we were very proud that even in 2005, 6, 7, 8, when new textbooks were being introduced, states ruled by different political parties adopted our textbooks at this very minor fee with which we gave permission to reprint them. And uh, we were very happy when some minister said from a state which was ruled by an opposition party at that time that these textbooks are professional books. They are not political. And we are very happy that now 10 years later, even though a completely different government is in place, our textbooks are carrying on. In, um, they, they occupy uh, some nearly, I should say, more than 15% uh, of the space uh, in terms of total number of schools in the country, even though CBSC, which is mandated to use our books in NCRT, covers only 4% of schools, nearly 15% of schools, which means many other state boards are using them. And once we calculated this, nearly 30% of the market is occupied by NCRT books. I think private publishers must ask, why haven't they nibbled into this market? <laughs> why is it such a big market which goes well beyond CBSC textbooks? Nobody else is supposed to read only NCRT textbooks. They are supposed to. I think the reason is that we, we have ended up doing something new in these books, which private publishers have yet to take note of. Our textbooks are not about facts. This whole exercise of national curriculum framework was led by a man who is a, a great scientist, Professor Yashpal. He's now in his 90 years right now. He was chairman of ISRO. He has been chairman of the Nuclear Winter Committee in Europe. He has seen a whole lot of the world. And he told us, he led us in this process to understand that the main job of education is to make students capable of wondering, wondering about things. That is the job of a good textbook, to open the mind to an imagined universe, open the mind to questions that are not answered in the textbook or anywhere. Make children wonder. How do you make children wonder? You don't make children wonder by giving facts and then fighting over them, which one is an authentic fact, which is not. You open the mind by posing good questions. You open the mind by leaving those questions unanswered. Instead, by showing where must I go to find answers or in pursuit of those questions so that I can have more questions. Where do I, what do I read next? We were the first publishing organization which carried advertisements of non-textbook publications of NCRT on the back inner cover of all of our textbooks. I, I request you to examine some of our books which are displayed outside. And we hope that our textbook, the hostage market we have in textbooks in NCRT, will open a bigger market of non-textbook publications of NCRT, which nobody reads, unfortunately, which are not bought, which sometimes just rot for years and years. We have some remarkable books which children ought to read, which teachers ought to read for their own intellectual nourishment, but they hadn't sold for decades. Many of them were editions of 1960s, which were still not out of print. We decided to advertise them on the backs of our own textbooks. Let it carry. And gradually the sale picked up. Very gradually. Still very gradual. But it picked up a little bit. We also decided that inside our textbooks we will give box items where we will mention other books that need to be read in order to get more details about what we are saying in the textbook. No textbook can be complete 
because the world is full of, you know, so much knowledge is there, so much more knowledge is going to be produced by the time a textbook becomes a few years old. So what is the best service we can do? We can ask uh, the child to read some more books. So inside lessons, we have given box items saying, look, this lesson is based basically on the work of these three scientists. Now, read some more articles, books. Here, are, here is a list. Uh, buy them, or some of them are accessible to internet. We have actually given internet addresses. <laughs> or we have mentioned the publishers. Many of them are private publishers. It was the first time NCRT was actually promoting, you can say, books published in the market. And we were saying, all book industry is our concern. Book industry is an educational industry. And it must understand the goals of education. And the goals of education, friends, I outlined for you in nutshell in the beginning, that education, the job of education, job of knowledge, as Mr. Vikran Mathur also said in the beginning, is to make a country richer, not merely in the pocket, but in the mind, capable of encompassing more complex realities where children grow up not literate. They become readers. They become permanent, curious readers who look at every new book with interest, talk about it, discuss it, make it a passion of their daily life, where we don't have to organize you know, these book fairs to boost the sale of books, where books sell like food. That's the kind of country we will have to become if we want to uh, use education for reaching those lofty ideals of the Constitution. Now, that, if that is the purpose, then I think the textbook business people will have to understand this business more deeply. Friends, good textbooks which make children wonder, which open up their minds, require two main changes in our perception. Number one, no one person can write such textbooks. In fact, textbooks cannot be written. Textbooks need to be developed with the help of debates and dialogues among people who want to work with children. And this is why, if you examine these books outside, please notice that not one of them has a writer's name. Instead, if you keep coming through, you will find on the fifth or sixth page, a page which calls itself Textbook Development Committee. Look at our social and political life, class 6, 7, 8. Look at our democratic theory, class 9, 10. These books, if you look at their composition, these books are in social sciences. They include people, of course, people who are in NCRT, who are faculty members of NCRT. They include academics, very serious academics from JNU, from various universities in the country like Pune, Guwahati, and so on, all over the country. We went to look for the best academics who wanted to join this enterprise of working for children. Then we have people who are working on the frontier areas. I call them frontier areas because that's where the system is failing. And our non-government organizations like Eklavya, like Vikramshila, these are the people who are working with those children who are uh, not served well by the government system or by the private system. So we had their representatives. And then we had teachers, rural teachers, urban teachers, who thought we must sit with academics to work out how this idea should be represented. And then we had, believe me, lawyers. In our social political life class seven, we had a young lawyer who participated intensely in discussions on subjects like water, for example. There's a whole, read the chapter on water. Water in the city of Chennai. That's what it discusses. Who gets how much water? Where does water go? Chennai is a nice example because there is scarcity of water. People respect water. Uh, in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, they are fighting over water all the time, over the Kaveri River, uh, which is supposed to flow through both. And now soon enough, I think many other rivers will have similar fights across states. So we thought, let's focus on this very interesting topic, how water is related to politics, how it's related to conflicting interests, Somebody wants to uh, build a water resort <laughs> near Chennai, wasting, in our judgment, you know, thousands of gallons of water. But from their perspective, if you go to the website of that water resort owner, he says, no, no, this is a great boost to India's economic growth. 
because it attracts tourists and so on. And these water sports entertain children. What is their perspective? We interviewed a housewife uh, living in the city of Chennai, asking her, what do you think of this water resort? <laughs> Uh, we went to areas where, in Chennai, where people wait for long hours uh, to fill up their little canisters of water. We wanted authentic pictures. We went to the Hindu archives, which is the, one of the major papers of Chennai. We similarly wanted uh, water-related dispute pictures over these major rivers like Narmada, for example, which has been in dispute for nearly 40 years. We went to Hindustan Times in their archives. They said, look, this is for children. Please give us some good pictures. We went to uh, various organizations which had delved into these subjects. They had documents. They had pictures. They had cartoons. They had uh, sketches. We went to some of the best artists available to draw certain pictures, uh, which we felt can't be conveyed through photographs and ideas that can't be conveyed in photographs. Producing one lesson on water meant that we bring people together and we show an example of what a textbook should be. This particular lesson leaves many questions unanswered because nobody has answers to those questions, partly. But also partly because we want to make children explorers in the world of ideas. We don't want this chapter to be used for memorization of facts. <laughs> so we have reduced the number of facts. There are hardly any facts. We knew that facts can now be found very easily on the internet. Why would a child bother about a 2006 textbook to find out the total quantum of water consumed in the city of Chennai? I'm sure if you say water in Chennai, Wikipedia, somebody will have an article on that, which will say needs to be edited and so on. Children must learn that knowledge is constantly growing, that past knowledge is not all that updated or relevant. They must realize that knowledge grows because I can further it. Every child contributes to knowledge. In fact, at one point, we thought we will have a contest, a national contest, and find mistakes in NCRT textbooks. If you can find five great mistakes, we'll give you a prize. <laughs> Professor Yashpal's idea, he thought, uh, let's hide some errors here and there. Let's see how well children read books. But you know, as an organization, we were a very, very vulnerable organization. We thought if we hide those books, those errors, and somebody points them out in the parliament, we have had it. As it is, I was spending many, many long afternoons and evenings in the parliament. So we didn't go that far. But friends, there is no limit to what you can do with the same syllabus. Supposing on this cashless economy, five years from now, my fantasy lesson comes. And there is a textbook which says, well, at what time did the PM address the nation? <laughs> that will become an exam question, a multiple question, multiple answer question. What was the date? Well, a good mugger will remember that the date was the same as the time. <laughs> 8 November, 8 PM. <laughs> but then, you know, and so on and so forth. You can have any number of facts. How much currency was uh, declared demonetized? 86%. Why? And so on and so forth. You can stuff that lesson with facts, and you can stop the process of thinking. Because facts don't lead to thinking. They lead to memorization. And all new educational ideals of the 20th century, and now we are in the 21st, all of those ideals are about making memorization unnecessary. We continue to be somehow a colonized mind on this matter. CBSE hasn't really moved very far away from the questions, even though we insisted a lot in NCRT and new textbooks don't encourage it, and yet so many questions are answerable by memory. But this pressure is generating, is begun to, has begun to be generated that even if textbooks have some items that encourage memorization, let's reduce those items. But then let's trigger desire for more books in different subject areas. And this is my second major point that I want to attract your attention to. In each area, if we want to use textbooks to boost educational publishing, which means to widen the scope of uh, business in uh, books, in readership, then we have to think very deeply. 
and engage with people who are in this business or look at books all over the world in other countries to see how they create good science books. How do they create good social science books? In fact, we had a whole workshop on this subject. What is the difference between a foreign science book and Indian science books? Because, you know, if you go to Chandni Chowk, Naisarak, you will find lots of Indian editions of books published in Britain or America on science. What is the difference? Why are there different books? The reason is that those textbooks don't cover the entire syllabus. Those foreign books are about specific areas within the sciences. Now, for example, on electricity, you can buy a whole British book, a, a British textbook on electricity. We'll get into much deeper areas of electricity. They are also more elaborate, more imaginative in terms of explaining concepts. As Professor Yashpal constantly used to say, it's pointless now to isolate any topic in science from other topics and other sciences. Uh, you cannot isolate chemistry anymore from biology, for example. And the solution is not to, not to produce a book in biochemistry, but rather to treat chemistry topics in such a way that a lot of biology gets inbuilt into them, or to treat a biology topic in such a way that a lot of chemistry gets built into them. Today, a topic like photosynthesis can be explained with far greater amount of chemistry because we know more chemistry about plants, about roots. We know how that chemistry works with physics, which is the light part of photosynthesis. You can publish a whole children's book on photosynthesis. And that book ought to be bought by a child who has been, you know, whose imagination has been turned on by the chapter on this subject in a textbook. He or she ought to be interested in reading a whole book on photosynthesis. We have a very old NCRT book, it's called Vimline Virus Land. We revived it during this period, updated it with the help of a great uh, scientist, and we said, I hope this book will sell with the new biology textbooks. Because there, a, a, a girl called Vimla is sick, she has our national you know, unknown disease called viral fever, <laughs> and uh, she wants to understand what kind of virus has afflicted me. So in her delirium, in the fever, in this nice book, uh, she meets some virus who says, I'll take you to virus land. <laughs> and there uh, she meets a few dozen viruses, and this virus tells her that actually there are lakhs of viruses, many of which human beings don't know. Look at these viruses that they have identified in the last 30 years. Human beings are going so slow in understanding us. <laughs> we will always be ahead of them. <laughs> and doctors in Delhi will have plenty of business <laughs> in the millennia to come. Very, very interesting book. When you close the book, if you are a 14-year-old student, uh, you will want to know more about everything. You will understand that viral fever cannot be cured by antibiotics. <laughs> and you will know why. And then you will understand that, you know, this is cheating. And you will understand so many more things. We thought of a biology book must carry an advertisement of Wimbledon virus land on the back cover so that that book sells. And perhaps in the next 10 years, 15 private publishers will publish many more books on viruses. Why don't they? I notice even the greatest private textbook publishers are not producing imaginative books for children. And each time you ask them, they say there is no market for them. Whose job is it to create that market if it's not our job? It's our job to make children capable of uh, wanting to know more, reading so in sciences, there's a tremendous scope for uh, getting into interdisciplinary kinds of concepts and creating uh, new kinds of material and taking the burden off the textbook. The textbook need not be such a fat book. In fact, we reduced greatly the length of books uh, in NCRT. We hoped that thinner books, books published in parts, will trigger greater desire to read other books Libraries will buy them. Children will be able to access them through various means. The challenge is very different in social sciences. Although this interdisciplinarity is the same issue, that history, politics, economy, they need to be read together. And there have to be books that the child can read after he has or she has understood the textbook lesson to understand better uh, what were 
the economic compulsions uh, of Indian people during, let's say, the late colonial period? How did the Second World War affect Indian emerging middle class? Question cannot be answered without going into history, going into geography, going into uh, economics, and various other factors are involved. And such elaborate treatment can't be given within the textbook. It has to be produced by an academic person uh, uh, who has studied that period, and then that interesting book for children has to be sold separately. The challenge is totally different in languages, where a textbook does draw attention to itself, because it claims to be a book that selects literature, which helps us to understand that language. So for English, for Hindi, for various other languages, there are these textbooks in the market. Uh, probably there are hundreds of textbooks. Unfortunately, many of them make very poor selections. These selections are from literature that is either very old or very didactic, uh, very preachy, full of, you know, everything is selected because it teaches a certain moral. Well, we thought, let's produce NCRT books that don't teach a moral. <laughs> because we published the Constitution preamble right on the first page, it has enough morality for modern Indians. <laughs> you know, liberty, freedom, equality, justice, these are the great morals of our times. Let's give them their due respect on page one. And now, let's teach literature. Literature's job is not to teach morals. Literature's job is to help readers imagine. Imagination is what the central goal of literary reading is, plus giving the best examples of how great writers, poets have used that language. Because we re when we read a great writer, like Krishna Sopti, our first lesson in grade six tech new textbook, please inspect it, is not a prayer. <laughs> this is the way old textbooks used to be. First lessons is either a prayer to God or a patriotic poem or something like that. We thought we'll start with Krishna Ji. Krishnaji has written in this, Krishna Sopti is the greatest living writer in Hindi today. In this lesson that we uh, have given from her Zindagi Nama, it's about how uh, she used to feel about the Dhoban when she was a young girl. <laughs> and what kinds of thoughts the Dhoban's arrival used to arise, arouse in her mind. And how did she wash and how did she iron their stories from Lahore pre-partition. It's a wonderful lesson to read for a... A uh, young boy or girl growing up in Delhi or anywhere in India today. And the language that Krishna Sopti uses itself is resonant with memories, with a uh, culture that is kind of uh, uh, a little bit less practiced today. Uh, it has uh, such rich vocabulary from Punjabi, from Urdu, from Persian, from Hindi, from Sanskrit. Uh, we thought, let's say textbook open with this. <laughs> and then there are lessons from various other, new poetry of Hindi, yeah, new kind of prose writing. And then we have translations. In each textbook we thought in literature, in language textbooks, 25% should be translation from other Indian languages, including English. This was the goal articulated in the national curriculum framework. And we followed that goal to the letter. I find it very interesting that no private publisher uh, even looked at that goal. It's a policy goal. You can see textbooks by major Delhi-based publishers for classes uh, 1 to 12 in Hindi. Not a single lesson represents a translation from Malayalam, Punjabi, Bangla, or anywhere else. Makes me deeply worried about how... Do our private publishers know what business they are in? They must read policy documents. National Curriculum Framework is a policy document. It's an approval of now... Uh, it's part of RTE, therefore it is approval of parliament, it's so on and so forth. It must be followed. And the, it's not a question of just following the law, like standing up for national anthem. It's not like that. It's supposed to be, you have the desire to follow it. Because it opens up India to this diverse society with so many languages. We said, let children get introduced to uh, the, the difference that content makes. Uh, that language makes to content by reading stories, poems from different languages of India, 25% of content. There are very different challenges in creating exercises in language textbooks from the exercises that are to be introduced in science or social science textbooks. These exercises, unfortunately, in language remain very, very stuck in old ideas. You can go back to a textbook of 1850, if you like, and you will still see that lesson in textbooks. Iske synonym likho. 
इसके विलोम लिखो एंड इवन द मोस्ट आई वुड कॉल यू नो इमेजिनेटिव प्राइवेट पब्लिशर्स कंटिन्यू इन दैट लाइन इट शॉक्स मी वेन दे से आदमी का विलोम क्या है औरत इट्स अ टू थाउजेंड सिक्सटीन टेक्सट बुक बाई ए मेजर पब्लिशर ऑफ डेली फ्रेंड्स आई मीन आई थॉट इन प्रेजेंस ऑफ उर्वशी बुटालिया आई मस्ट मैंशन दिस आदमी का विलोम औरत है क्या होगा हमारे देश में जेंडर का If we are still teaching that as a fact, and that too in a language textbook, "gaon ka vilom likho nagar" and so on and so forth, absolutely baseless propagandist grammar. I mean, grammar is not a space for propaganda. Grammar is a space for engaging with the capacities that a language has or is developing now, and therefore it should be used for coinage of new words, understanding how words get coined. how new structures emerge and many linguists are available in our country to deal with grammar in that imaginative way rather than in this old way that grammar is fixed certain rules were written by so and so long ago and we ren and martin or panini or whoever and we keep on just regurgitating those rules i gave these few few examples in order to illustrate for you how much not just financial but intellectual investment needs to be made to reach out for that bigger goal of expanded business which mr vikram mathu was talking about yes we have yes yeah, it goes without saying i mean i mean some of these things are so shibboleths that i hate to use them like people talk about demographic dividend who gave it to us god gave it to us we haven't created demographic dividend ourselves big market yes it's a big market because we are a big country but the market could be much much bigger the goal is not simply the market market is a means of reaching the bigger goals of education and if those bigger goals are reached he said and rightly said if those loftier goals of education are reached then we will be a wealthier country so knowledge and wealth that way are generated together but knowledge is not facts knowledge is imagination knowledge is wondering wondering creates good scientists and also wondering leads to reading more things and so on 